Uh, my name is Barbara Petroselli. I'm the assistant director. No, I'm not. I'm the assistant vice president of academic affairs. Sorry, new title, just still getting used to it. Uh, here at the Mount. And um, on behalf of my IROC co conspirators, uh, Vivian Milzarski in the library and Evan Merkhofer in natural sciences, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's IROC presentation by Dr. Michael McGuire. Uh, for those of you who may not have been to an IROC before, let me say a little bit about what that is. IROC stands for Investigating Research on Campus. And it is an opportunity for us to hear from our faculty in all of our divisions about the research that they're working on. Um, so as you can imagine, this results in topics which are very diverse. And we hear about some, I, I like to think of it as there being something for everybody in IROC because um, the subject matter is so uh, varying and wide ranging. The next IROC presentation will actually be this coming Monday, so just a few days from now at noon. So this is kind of a special day and time that we do once a semester. So on this coming Monday, March 1st, um, Dr. Tom Fitzmorris, who is an assistant professor of finance in the MSMC School of Business, is going to be presenting on service learning and business programs. So I hope that if you are free at that time that you'll join us. I have a special announcement today, which is that uh, all of the recordings of our IROC presentations have just been added as a playlist to the MSMC YouTube channel, which is great. So that means that you can go back and look, these go as far back as last fall. So if you're interested in uh, listening to a uh, IROC presentation that you may have missed or something that you want to listen to again, um, now you'll have a chance to do that. I will be sending a link to that YouTube channel out to the campus in the next few days, so you can keep your eyes open for that. Um, in terms of housekeeping, um, Dr. McGuire is happy to take your questions as we go, as he moves through his presentation. So you can raise your hand, uh, you can put it in the chat, um, and then he, uh, Vivi, with Vivian's help, will uh, try to catch you catch your question and make sure that um, he has a chance to answer it. Of course, as I mentioned, we do record these uh, presentations, but you are not obligated to leave your camera on if you don't wish to, that's perfectly fine. However, um, please do mute your microphone unless you're uh, talking with the presenter. And for students who are here and um, are attending for FYE credit or extra credit in a class, we ask that you enter your name and either FYE or the name of the class that you're getting extra credit in. If you've entered that, please in the chat, then we'll make sure that you, you know, you get your uh, extra credit as you intend. For any community members we have here, any folks who are not uh, employees or students at the Mount, um, if you would like to receive notices about upcoming events at the college, you could also use the chat to enter your email address. And um, of course, we'd be happy to let you know about the things that we have coming up. In addition, of course, you would, uh, I could email you with the link to today's presentation and our other IROC presentations as well. So um, that's it on the housekeeping end. Thank you all again so much for being here today. And Vivian will now take over and introduce Dr. Michael McGuire. Okay. <clears throat> Michael McGuire has studied history throughout his education, earning a bachelor's degree at Vassar College and a PhD at Boston University. He has taught at multiple institutions in the greater Boston area, despite not being a fan of the Patriots or of Tom Brady, hashtag cheaters never prosper, <laughs> before coming to the Mount. His prior and current research, scholarship, and presentations focus, uh, focus on the reasons that people enter humanitarian projects and how the charitable assistance they provide intersects with cultural and diplomatic concerns. Professor McGuire's talk comes from research he conducted uh, to publish A War Generation, the Radcliffe College Community in the Great War Era, 1914 to 1926, in the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. In this research, he sought to determine whether a women's college that traditionally represented itself as civic-minded 
did in fact get swept up in what one scholar called America's World War I, quote, culture of coercive volunteerism, unquote. His work established that some faculty, students, and alumni did not involve themselves in war-related concerns, but that many, notably Radcliffe's president, shirked their civic and moral duty in a time of unprecedented global crisis. Dr. Michael McGuire. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, just a slight correction. I actually, the hashtag is cheaters ever prosper because while I don't like uh, Belichick or Brady, they have done well. But yeah, it's a, it's, it's a dark irony. So thank you all for attending. Uh, let me begin. In late 1917, the Radcliffe News, the campus paper for the all-female Cambridge, Massachusetts College, grew tired at its campus's indifferent World War I activity. Since April of that year, millions of American women had started tasks deemed vital to America's budding war effort against Imperial Germany. At fellow all-female Northeastern colleges like Smith and Wellesley in Massachusetts and Barnard outside of uh, Manhattan, presidents and faculty had effectively encouraged students' active war service. Radcliffe's record trailed that of American women and American women's colleges. Its president, LeBaron Russell Briggs, ignored patriotic calls to inspire, inspire vigorous war activity. Radcliffe's 574 students proved no better. By November 1917, only 39 undergraduates had joined the college's Red Cross chapter, only 72 had started war work, and just 115 had loaned money to the U.S. government or rolled bandages for the war. One student insisted she had, quote unquote, done enough just by buying a Liberty Bond and giving to the Red Cross. In frustration, the Radcliffe News's December 4th headline asked, quote, does Radcliffe know that our country is at war, end quote. Radcliffe's sluggish, fickle World War I activity refu refutes idealistic notions of why students and alumni got involved in war acti activity. Despite 1918 graduate Helen Bacon's recollections, Congress's April 6, 1917 war declaration never made her class, quote, a war generation that loyally rolled bandages and zealously knitted, end quote. On-campus activity proved fickle until victory appeared certain. Alums acted slightly more patriotically. A majority of them alive at the time, over 1,300, reported starting war tasks. 12 graduates even reversed war damages after the November 1918 armistice. Yet domestic currents that framed women's patriotic war labors as socially compelled or as gateways to legal and professional equality really do not explain why graduates did what they did. Many alums disagreed with Radcliffe War Work Committee Chair, Christina Baker, that war service was appropriate, quote, work for American women and college women, end quote. Instead, they latently self-determined their war tasks and tenure, regardless of national or professional concerns. Most importantly, no Radcliffe affiliate suffered sanction for careless attitudes toward war relief. For Radcliffe members, patriotic citizenship was an elective, not a requisite. Radcliffe's First World War record disrupts, as Vivian just noted, prior historical reasons given for American women's activism in political and social war causes. It negates notions that US women's war life was uniform, or as Chris Capazzola put it, coerced in some way. None of Radcliffe's ideal great war partakers linked their work to suffrage or to full citizenship. Its war record then contests claims by historians Robin Muncie, Susan Zeiger, Kimberly Jensen, and Lynn Duminil that American females entered war work to confirm voting rights or broaden careers. Even among lesbian Radcliffe alums, of which I identify two in this paper, there was no pervasive war venue, outlook, or aim suggesting limits to gender's use as a historical category. Radcliffe members' diffuse war lives suggest Americans so quickly shed the specter of post-war global commitment because so few wartime Americans feared it or believed in it. Radcliffe's war acts before the US formally got involved in the conflict in April 1917 show that charitable notions, not suffrage or duty, inspired their actions. President Briggs thought that by November 1914, quote, Radcliffe girls had contributed all they could to end war suffering. 
Now, end quote. Now, keep in mind, that's three months into a war that goes on for four more years. Radcliffe seniors agreed. December that year, they rejected a proposal by two seniors, Elsa Stone and Martha Knoll, to allocate prom funds, roughly $82, to fund a Red Cross nurse's relief of innocent war victims. Elsa Stone noted that Wellesley College's seniors had decided to forego their own senior prom for war sufferers, and she asked that, quote, Radcliffe not be outdone, end quote. Five fellow seniors quickly derided the idea as foolish. Only 12 women envisioned attending prom and harmful to juniors whose formal utilized the seniors' facilities. Three of these five seniors favored fighting, quote, war depression and sorrow, if standard social functions continued, end quote. The senior class put the matter up to a vote and in December seniors voted, quote, almost unanimously to have prom as usual, end quote. Over the next two calendar years, 1915 to 1916, Radcliffe undergrads proved equally unmoved. They only collected $150 for war orphans and to help out Jewish victims of World War I compared to spending $240 on one prom. They merely crafted 2,000 medical items for war hospitals in the same time. Now, alums shouldered greater though discretionary war service during these two years. Most worked stateside, but at their convenience. 130 of them rolled bandages for organizations like the Red Cross, like the Special Aid Society, and like a new agency called the American Fund for French Wounded which collected and delivered medical supplies to French army hospitals in Western Europe. 24 Radcliffe grads worked overseas. Uh, this included Gertrude Stein and her romantic partner, Alice Toklas, who actually delivered some of these goods that the Red Cross and the American Fund for French Wounded made. It also included Ruth Holden, who then was studying a graduate, uh, pro in a graduate program in Cambridge University she suspended her studies to help refugee Polish children then in the Russian empire. Now these women thought their acts charitable, not dutiful, and never referenced suffrage or professions as service motives. Now subsequent international events intensified Radcliffe war activism, but along distinctly generational lines. By May 19, March 1917, there were two key events. First, the Zimmerman Telegram's publication, which showed Germany was trying to get America distracted by calling on Mexico to attack America. Second, Germany had commenced a month-long unrestricted submarine warfare against American ships and American lives. Both acts made war appear imminent. In response, eight women's college presidents, including LeBaron Russell Briggs, quickly offered Woodrow Wilson their, quote, loyal service and wholehearted support, end quote. As Congress debated Wilson's war declaration request, the president of the Special Aid Society, Mrs. Barrett Wendell, called on Radcliffe students to enhance America's security by devoting, quote, part of their time to war relief, end quote. Radcliffe Civics Club, which stimulated on-campus, quote, interest in current problems, end quote, asked undergrads to state publicly what, quote, they could do for their country, end quote. Now, the news praised both overtures, but insisted students could display, quote, loyalty by a ready self-denial of time, money, and effort for war-related work and sustain their social calendar, end quote. Radcliffe undergraduates again defined war service as an elective subordinate to social norms. Now, during these same three months, January to March 1917, 80 alums started or joined war-related charities in America and Europe to help civilians and troops. But still, the idea that this was an obligation or a duty was very much an outlier in terms of a motive for why these 80 women aided war victims. When Congress declares war on Germany on April 6, 1917, Radcliffe rhetoric intensifies in favor of war and Radcliffe war work does begin to increase. The college's New York club gave $25 to Harvard's medical unit. Radcliffe's alumni quarterly framed the death of Ruth Holden in April 1917 from typhoid fever as letting the college share, quote, in the sacrifice the world is making for the establishment of ideals, end quote. A clear nod to Wilson's aim to safeguard democracy. 
Ironically, Ruth Holden thought Wilson, quote, lacked the backbone to wage war, end quote. The class of 1917's graduation catalyzed graduates' pre preparedness. The commencement speaker was Harvard professor and future Smith College president, William Nielsen. He insisted Radcliffe women, quote, had a duty not to shirk war obligations on the grounds of personal liberty, end quote. Nielsen suggested robust alums should assume, quote, sacrifices and services, end quote, akin to European women farmers, mechanics, and subway drivers. Less healthy ladies could safeguard, quote, national spirits from hatred and conceit, end quote. Now, Nielsen warned women's failure to bolster, quote, national policies boldly framed on ideal bases for mankind's higher welfare would abolish the physical and moral forces strengthening America, end quote. So the simple message is that if women did not get involved in war-related tasks, America would crumble at home while it was fighting for the world abroad. Nielsen's insistence that American women's war service was obligatory paralleled Americans' patriotic framings of wartime work. Like New York alums soliciting loyal service, Nielsen insisted Radcliffe women's war labors were, quote, a political obligation to the federal government, end quote, just like the month earlier Selective Service Act made registering for the draft an obligation for American men. Still, it was unclear whether Nielsen or President Briggs believed that Radcliffe's elite women would work, quote, as a pleasant and diversionary hobby or as an inclusive form of coercive voluntarism, end quote. Regardless of what Nielsen thought, Radcliffe's students and grads quickly agreed to form what they called a war work committee to guide the college's war service. At the com commencement dinner, there were further speeches by Nielsen, Radcliffe President Briggs, and French Colonel Paul Lazon, then in Boston, to help train Harvard men for war service. Paul Lazon urged Radcliffe women to get involved in the war, but to stay in the U.S., where he said, quote, you will have more than enough to do soon, end quote. Now, Nielsen and Azan inspired stri striking, though not common, elective action from graduates. Nearly a thousand of them started leading or staffing official, semi-official, and unofficial war outfits. Most listened to Azan and served in the U.S., including 50 women in branches of the U.S. government. Yet this federal service did not foster submissive notions or lead alums to link their work to suffrage or careers. Elizabeth Putnam and Mary Lee were two such graduates. They were essentially uh, nurses' aides for the American Expeditionary Force, the U.S. Army operation guiding U.S. military troops in Western Europe. Both insisted in 1918 that they could leave their posts at will, not exactly a sign of patriotic notion. And Elizabeth Putnam did exactly this in mid-1918 at the height of early American military operations. Edith Stedman, another Radcliffe graduate, ran a YMCA canteen hut assisting U.S. troops in France. She had the same view that she could leave her post as, at will. None of these three women championed suffrage or linked her tasks to job aims. All thought their presence was optional. It was only Dr. Grace Jordan who entered a military medical post that actually utilized her professional training and skills. By contrast, another Radcliffe medical alum, Dr. Augusta Williams, who was the War Work Committee's token sponsored aid worker, Dr. Williams complained that the Red Cross foolishly had her treating French refugees when her pre-war experience as a surgeon and an anesthetist made her highly qualified to sedate wounded U.S. troops. Many alums during this uh, first year of belligerency completely ignored a call to serve. A March 1918 war work survey by that war work committee found that only 10% of all graduates had begun war tasks over the past 11 months. Now, this action by alums was far greater in terms of engagement with what we see on campus at Radcliffe. In April 1917, Radcliffe News Editorial asserted that Radcliffe women's first war duty was, quote, to live as normally as possible and to preserve justifiable senior festivities by eliminating extravagance and waste, end quote. President Briggs agreed. In March 1917, the National Emergency Food Garden petitioned him to spur students to 
plant food gardens, quote, to augment America's and the world's food resources, end quote. Three weeks later, the Intercollegiate Bureau of Occupations asked Briggs to start war emergency courses to prepare students for war service. He denied both requests. Briggs insisted that students needed no further extracurricular war tasks as they did enough work, quote, as individuals in on-campus organizations or in Boston, end quote. Initial student activity poorly fulfilled this statement. The Radcliffe News encouraged loyal purchases of Liberty Bonds and growing uh, food in perhaps a Radcliffe farm army, similar to that established by Barnard College's Dean, Virginia Gildersleeve, which was known as the Farmerettes Unit because they were suffragettes arguing they could prove they deserved the right to vote by growing food to feed the country in wartime. However, by May 1917, the only major contribution to war work was a donation of $25 to the Red Cross by the sophomore class. Radcliffe students at this time very much showed that the Ladies Home Journal, the premier magazine for uh, middle-class white women in America, was right to worry that there were, quote, home front women slackers consumed in social frivolity and unwilling to surrender comforts, end quote. Now, campus war service does increase in the 1917-1918 academic year, but shirkers of service suffered no clear consequences. President Briggs did inaugurate, yet marginalize war emergency courses. He and Harvard President Lawrence Lowell decided these classes would, quote, not count to a degree, and that nearby women's colleges would administer medical degrees to women who graduated with a full Harvard medical education, end quote. To put that in comparison, it would be as if the Mount called on its School of Nursing students, business students, communication students to engage in work related to the pandemic. But even though it would meet the uh, definition of an internship, no credit is offered. It makes the task of being a student and a civically minded American difficult in a time of crisis. Now, interestingly, students at Radcliffe shared President Briggs' sentiment that individuals wore work was a supplement, an elective to their college experience. In the campus government, the Radcliffe Unit and the, or the Radcliffe Union and Radcliffe's Red Cross chapter, students insisted that they began the year, quote, splendidly responding to present needs by choosing twice weekly war tasks to start, by perusing war courses in surgical dressings and first aid, and by giving funds to war charities, end quote. College associations also, prou also proudly announced that they were suspending their, war acti their social activities to make room for war, uh, war work. The Radcliffe Guild, a social work organization, ended its sewing bee and its Christmas sale. Radcliffe's theatrical, musical, and civic societies reduced their social calendars. The Radcliffe News ended its tea parties. And the senior and junior classes donated money to the YMCA and loaned money to the government through Liberty Bonds. Uh, the junior class even voted to uh, fund a French war orphan named Marcel Jojolin and sent her family's extended family money for Christmas celebrations. So this is a triumph, but it's a very hollow one. In October, there's discussion of war work in Europe, starving civilians, and American activity on behalf of both. But by the end of the month, only 10% of students had actually done anything for the war. The next month, Radcliffe's uh, medical uh, bandage production trailed that of Smith and Wellesley, and also Radcliffe's own production a year earlier. Radcliffe's total gifts to the YMCA, roughly $1,800, trailed Wellesley College's donations of $16,000, despite both campuses very much belonging to affluent social circles. Prom preparations in fall 1917 underscored undergrads' wishes to preserve their status quo. Senior and junior officers voted, quote, to have as simply and an inexpensive a formal as possible, end quote. Now, to be fair, the classes of 1918 and 1919 gave more money to the Liberty Loan campaign, to the Red Cross, and to the YMCA together than they spent on their proms. But what they spent on their respective proms was more than they gave individually to the Red Cross, to the US government, or to the YMCA. So this shows there is still very much the desire to preserve the status quo for the social calendar. And this is one of the reasons why that 
Radcliffe December 4th, Radcliffe News December 4th, 1917 headline asked if the campus really appreciated the crisis America faced. Now, greater patriotic forces in 1918 did eventually increase Radcliffe's war work for both administrators and students. In January, Herbert Hoover, then the food administrator for the entire country, and uh, Barnard professor Delia Marble, who ran the Women's Land Army of America, one of these farmerette organizations, both of these individuals petitioned Radcliffe President LeBaron Russell Briggs to help some or all of his graduating women farm and raise food. A month later, the Women's National Farm and Garden Association sought 180 Radcliffe students for paid regional farm work. Now, President LeBaron Russell Briggs of Radcliffe responds to Hoover, but ignores the other two appeals from the Dean of Barnard College and also from this Women's National Garden Association, an ironic move suggesting that even though he was the president of a women's college, he was at some level a sexist. This does, however, by reaching out to Herbert Hoover, he does agree to help launch a farm unit for, quote, agricultural work where labor was scarce, end quote. And this was led by both a, a student chairperson, junior Priscilla Ring, and by Radcliffe College's treasurer, Ezra Baker, who both believed that the farm unit would inspire, quote, young women and remind Harvard men of their duty, end quote. So here you do have the belief that this is a patriotic obligation. However, at the same time the college treasurer is doing this, President LeBaron Russell Briggs of Radcliffe College is refusing any sort of personal patriotic work. The U.S. government calls on him to give, quote, a brief sketch of Radcliffe at war, end quote. He refuses to do this. And that shows that at the same time the college and its administrators are beginning to do work, there's still no consequence for the ultimate leader declining to do work at Radcliffe. Now, when you get to the end of the spring 1918 term, it appears that there's more buy-in to this belief that it is an obligation to serve. In January, there are 135 new student members of Radcliffe's Red Cross chapter. 63 other students enrolled in nearby Red Cross branches, but still, by the end of the month, just 40% of the students are in the Red Cross, America's official war charity. The next month, February, you do get an appeal from President Briggs to produce more surgical dressings for American military hospitals. Ironic again, given that he himself is not taking on war activity. Now this appeal, this uh, public call to action does lead to more dressings being produced by mid-March, uh, roughly 2,400 in one week. And the student manager of this workroom, Dorothy Manx insists this number showed Radcliffe's quote, true spirit of loyalty, end quote. You also get appeals from students, from nearby faculty members, and by mid-May, two seniors, Priscilla Thorpe and Hilra Stewart, decide to eradicate any war indifference by holding, quote, a large patriotic meeting to start students' devotion to total war activity, end quote. And here they succeed. By the end of the spring 1918 term, Radcliffe students have donated thousands of dollars, uh, hundreds of pounds of clothing, and have made 40,000 medical dressings for the Red Cross, even though the materials to make these bandages are in ridiculously short supply at the time. Radcliffe did even more over the summer. Between June and September 1918, the farm unit sent 25 students to raise crops in Dummer, at, at Dummer Academy, a Massachusetts boys prep school. Their activity very much mirrored that of farmerettes. Uh, they worked at equal wages to unskilled male laborers, four cents an hour. They accomplished a great deal of work, at least $2,300 hours of patriotic harvesting. Uh, they even earned accolades and praise from the farmers they worked for, who referred to them as, quote, better than many men in their service, end quote. The main difference between Radcliffe students and the rest of these farmerettes is that Radcliffe undergraduates got to enjoy Dummer Academy's, quote, golf, tennis, canoeing, and other sports facilities, end quote, while they were serving the country. And this shows that the height of America's World War I activity, these patriotic undergraduates were still trying to sustain their own pre-war normality. It's only when you get to fall 1918 that Radcliffe appears fully catalyzed for war work. Every medically cleared student was uh, weekly serving in some branch of war service. 
By the armistice, Radcliffe's senior president insisted that the college was, quote, an educational institution and a supply station of war volunteers, end quote. Uh, this senior president, Edith Smith, praised students for seeking teas, parties, and receptions for war essentials. Smith insisted that students' war activity immerse them in a culture that taught loyalty to America, loyalty to Radcliffe, and encouraged, quote, working for others, end quote. Yet as students and alumni were more fully mobilized on their terms and America's, Radcliffe's president is still shirking similar labors. In September 1918, the U.S. Propaganda Agency, the Committee on Public Information, contacted Briggs and again asked him to, quote, enlist Radcliffe administrators in the National Four Minute Men Organization, end quote. For those who don't know, uh, in 1918, movie halls would take four minutes to take off one cinema reel and put on another. This was the time that uh, you would have addresses to the audience, musical entertainment, or when you get to the wartime fighting, calls to solicit uh, donations of goods, donations of money for war uh, charities. Briggs did not reply to this. And you know, that shows that you know, even as the war is going on, he does not get involved and he suffers no negative consequences for it. So what happens when the fighting ends? The November 1918 armistice leads to an unscheduled day's vacation for Radcliffe to celebrate. It also completely destroys any rationale for war service. Uh, there's an effort in November 1919 to call on Radcliffe to start some sort of post-war work for war victims in Europe, and no one really appears interested on, in doing that on the campus. Most community members no longer thought war-related labors as patriotic. In January of 1919, the college nullified any war work pledges by students or faculty or administrators. By April 1st, when New England's Red Cross Division is asking for clothing, to help out one and a half million European refugees who have worse conditions now that the fighting has ended, Radcliffe's war board stopped directing any war activity. Even war, or war humanitarian activists on campus realized that their, uh, their moment was up. In November 1919, Radcliffe senior Janet Evans asked students to just sew once a week for quote, for France's starving children, end quote. A month later, she acknowledged that her peers preferred, quote, more trivial pursuits like countless teas and a full number of plays over refugee relief, end quote. Now, Radcliffe's administrators, administrators likewise agreed that the end of fighting ended war work. In January of 1919, the principal of Dummer Academy writes a letter to President Briggs of Radcliffe College, thanking him for the women's service, but also proposing that their arrangement end. Briggs agrees. Now, you may think that's not a big deal. It is a big deal because it's not until eight months later that the U.S. government suggests that these women farmers scale down their activity. So it's not the U.S. government that says this is no longer a needed vital wartime service. It's the president of Radcliffe College who says these women are free to go home. Alums very much thought the same thing. Radcliffe's Alumni Quarterly largely ignored printing stories of post-armistice war work by graduates. Dr. Augusta Williams, the campuses and colleges token war worker in France, also wanted to get home. She thought the Red Cross was, quote, absolutely inconsiderate of my time, end quote. She wanted to get back to a lucrative career anesthetizing patients in post-war America. It's only 12 students, former students, who begin post-war humanitarian tasks. This includes a seven member Radcliffe unit, which was in fact formed after the fighting to help restore war-torn parts of France and return them to some sort of pre-war existence. This unit was Radcliffe's signature post-war act. And it shows that it's not about patriotism, it's not about suffrage, it's also not about career. It started after um, the American Red Cross had stopped sending any refugee aid into France. Its founder, Radcliffe alum Lucy Stockton, helped interested parties subvert U.S. State Department guidelines on restricting visas to Americans entering Europe. So it's definitely not patriotic. Uh, its workers were also very unqualified for the work they did or the work they proposed to do as uh, drivers, as uh, social workers, and as nurses. Uh, save Lucy Stockton, there are only two other members of the unit who did any work related to the war before 1919. 
uh, women describing their work in France and after they come home from France never indicate they're doing this to prove that they are loyal American citizens or to earn the right to vote. In fact, two of them left France after four months of work and three others plan to do likewise but change their mind. Most importantly, over half of these uh, individuals don't have the qualifications to help people in need. Three of them had not finished their nursing courses or their automobile courses before applying to drive cars and trucks and also nurse people back to health. Uh, one of them, Anna Holman, uh, then in a romantic relationship with Abigail Elliott, had absolutely no medical or social work or driving experience, despite offering to be a nurse, a social worker, and a chauffeur in France. Even someone who had eventually all the requisite documentation, Julia Collier, proved that having the qualifications means nothing. Her physical proclaimed that she had, quote, sound health, end quote. A month after getting to France, she suffers a complete breakdown and leaves two months later. Now, despite being underqualified, the unit did succeed in some ways in helping these French people recover. Anna Holman, uh, Helen Burridge, Hester Brown and Catherine Shortall effectively ran community centers, provided first aid, and sold needed uh, general household items in France's war-torn Picardy region. They and Lucy Stockton received praise from the thousands of French peasants they helped recover from the war and from France's government and France's Red Cross societies. Their records show that even apparent unpatriotic and unqualified volunteers could effectively advance humanitarian missions. So what is the lesson of Radcliffe students, alums, and administrators' World War I record? Well, as I mentioned in the brief blurb uh, that was sent out through the IROC uh, committee, we like to think that in a time of crisis, everyone will shoulder their fair share for a higher purpose, and that this would be especially true among members of a college family who share cultural experiences and a, sh a cherished place of memory, a college campus. But this was definitely not the case with the Radcliffe College community during World War I. Yes, over 2,000 members of this college community did assist people who suffered during the global crisis. Yet many students, faculty, administrators, and alumni shirked war service or favorably negotiated how they would superficially enter and exit the First World War. Radcliffe students and president proved consistently unwilling to sacrifice traditions like proms and chauvinistic curricular arrangements to make the world safer for people and for democracy, or simply to trumpet Radcliffe's war service and war accomplishments. The Radcliffe College community's 1914-1920 war record shows that these women and men did not consider solicited patriotic action to be a civic duty during wartime. I hope their past actions and inaction inspire us in 2021 to valuable service within our own campus community, for our own campus community, for our Mid-Hudson region, our country, and our world. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. All right. Do, does anyone have any questions at this point? Uh, Glenn, yeah. Uh, great, great talk there, Michael. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, was there any discernible anti-war movement on, on the Radcliffe campus? Not, not really. And I think part of the reason was that you, when you have the Zimmerman telegram, when you have the unrestricted submarine warfare, even, you know, the critics of Wilson, you know, the people like Theodore Roosevelt, the preparedness campaigns, they argued that the, you know, the situation produced in March 1917 made war necessary. The main uh, question was, what does the campus do? I mean, that was, and that's yeah. a question that you get in, you know, men's universities, women's colleges around uh, the U.S. and in, in Europe. So no, oddly enough, there, there isn't, even though they had some Quaker students, uh, even Quaker colleges, Bryn Mawr, Smorthmore, Haverford, uh, Whittier, the one that uh, Richard Nixon attended, uh, the statement is, you know, we need to get involved, but we'll do so in a way that we can serve our country patriotically, but also our conscience. And that's why the war in some ways is unifying for the country. But for the most part, I think everyone's deciding what is patriotic and what is service. And that, I think, divorces uh, individual actions from a greater collective rationale. 
I, I'm, I'm surprised that Jane Addams was not more influential in, in her early opposition to the war. Yeah, no, I agree, especially because so many college, women's college campuses were supplying her with social workers. I, I think yeah. part of the, I think part of the reason is that the peace ship uh, expedition is such a disaster. And after the Zimmerman telegram, after the essentially nine month effort to catch Pancho Villa after yeah. you know, the unrestricted submarine warfare, it's hard to offer a justification that Germany is not threatening the United States. And I think that's part of the reason why there's such broad support. The problem is it's, it's a really superficial reason to declare war because most of these actions haven't touched Americans. And that's why I think when you get to 1919 and 1920, so many returning American war uh, servicemen and a few women and people who got involved in the war are asking, why did we do this again? And that's when the German propaganda machine kicks up and says, well, really, we never attacked you guys. Yeah. You attacked us. And that undercuts this image of, you know, getting involved, getting committed and helping to reconstruct a different Europe. Yeah. Thank you for the question, by the way, sorry. I have a question for you. Sure. Was there anything in the Radcliffe's president's past, you know, actions or writings or statements or anything that would have predicted that he would take this position during the war? I don't think so. Uh, LeBaron Russell Briggs does not have a biography, so I'm, I've relied very much on histories of Radcliffe. And for the most part, they represent him as sort of a standard bearer of conventional middle-class American activity. And that, I think, makes you think, well, all right, maybe in the early months of the war, he's not getting involved because most of America is not getting involved. And it's not until you know, early 1917 that Americans get involved. What I think makes him an outlier is he signs that letter to Woodrow Wilson saying, you know, we will pledge our loyal and wholehearted service to this cause, to the war effort. And unlike the other seven presidents signing that, he himself does nothing. Uh, William Nielsen goes to Smith College, encourages Smith students greater activity. He supports the creation of a Smith College relief unit to help out uh, French refugees. Uh, Wellesley's president does the same thing. Vassar's president, Henry uh, McCracken, does the same thing. For whatever reason, LeBaron Russell Briggs just does not think this is worth his time. Even though you have so many people that reach out, it's really only Herbert Hoover who shames him into action. And even then, it's, you know, Briggs agrees that Radcliffe students can form a farm association without necessarily Briggs doing anything for that work or any other war work. And did any of those other seven sister colleges, presidents, so you said no one else called him out on it. So there was no yeah. correspondence. They were not urging him to participate or to get the college more involved. Yeah, and I think part of it was that in many ways, today we think circulars, emails would fly very quickly. At this point, each one of these colleges is looking inward and saying, well, what do we do? Do we uh, get students to do something? Do we get alumni to do something? Do we give to the Red Cross? Do we form our own organization? At Wellesley, Ellen Pendleton is debating this within her trustees and uh, students and faculty. Uh, Smith College, Will Nielsen is doing the same thing. Henry McCracken is doing the same thing. And I think that's the, the odd thing. Despite this original statement, there's no effort to compare and contrast or even to do circulars. Here's what we're doing. Right. What are you doing? Or if there is, uh, Briggs decided not to consign it to the archives. Let me ask you something, other thing. Is he, he considered to be a good, have been a good college president in his time? In the sense that he made Radcliffe a respectable institution and did get greater Radcliffe women's access to Harvard medical court or Harvard courses, yes. The problem is that he never seemed, uh, from my own reading of him, to be a champion for Radcliffe College as an independent institution. It very much functioned as the women's annex of Harvard University. And I, I think that's the, the major problem. Whereas if you look at the other seven sisters, they really are meant to be on their own. You know, Bryn Mawr is founded uh, with the goal of encouraging professors not just to teach, but to research and prepare the next generation of women activists and educators and 
policymakers. LeBaron Russell Briggs is very much encouraging students to keep things exactly as they are. And that I think is one of the reasons why students thought, well, we don't need to do anything. You know, we can have prom as usual. We can still spend more money on prom than we give to the Red Cross because there's no sort of uh, countervailing force within the faculty or the administration urging them to do otherwise. Very interesting. I'd like to uh, thank you for the uh, you know, information, but to me, this just opens up an entirely new uh, scope of investigation that can take place. Number one, women's uh, ability to vote wasn't passed until 1920. So women were basically misogynist you know, results there. Uh, they were taken advantage of and basically considered second class citizens. Number two, the uh, makeup of the student body was primarily upper middle class and upper class students, which tend to be diverse and divorced from the norm of American society. And so they were used to having their, you know, uh, parties and stuff like that. And being, it's like the old, uh, you know, um, uh, let them eat cake syndrome. All right. Uh, so to me, this opens up a huge new amount of investigation that could be done into the uh, social norms of the time, uh, the uh, um, amount of uh, interaction that was caused because they didn't have a vote, uh, the misogyny of the period when women were considered second-class citizens, and so on. So to me, this opens up a whole new world of investigation that I've never even thought about. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you belatedly, uh, Barbara, for uh, your questions. Yeah, uh, sir, yeah, the, uh, the, the interesting thing is that you're right, you know, you think like, okay, why are, you know, why should we, we be worried that they're not getting involved or find it odd that they're not getting involved? Part of it is that these other institutions that are recruiting the same wealthy, Protestant, white, upper middle class, aristocratic uh, daughters, they are getting involved in some way. They're giving more in terms of money. They're doing more in terms of volunteering, making more bandages, sponsoring more activities. And I think that's, uh, you're right to note that, you know, it is traditionally, these are not women who are expected to do so. There's no, you know, obligation. But there is still this, you know, social ideal from the, the Gilded Age and the progressive era that if you're a wealthy woman, you know, this is your way to have some sort of influence. You know, you can't vote. You're right. But you can work for a charity. You can give to a charity. You can make things to donate. You can get involved in an unofficial capacity. And I think the weird thing for Radcliffe is even though there are these established ways for women to do something, most of these young women are choosing not to do it. Uh, and perhaps it's because you're right, you know, this is the environment they grew up in. But I think it's also because administrators, alums, their president is not, uh, th none of these in individuals or actors are urging them to do something. I mean, you, I can't see LeBaron Russell Briggs moving a hair on his head. By contrast, our president has given the hair off his head for students and for, you know, the campus. It's a little cringeworthy almost, isn't it? To yeah. hear the statements about not wanting to, well, I could do something, but I have to have my prom and I don't want to be disturbed. Like, why don't you release me from this service commitment or whatever, because I have my, re my regular life to live. It's it, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. hold on. No, I agree. And that's why I think it's interesting because if you think about, you know, how the history of the pandemic and other crises are written 50 years from now, People, oh yeah, I did my part. I isolated, I wore a mask. The difference is we have video, we have, you know, assuming like archives of Twitter posts, et cetera, where we can say, okay, were you? You know, do we have proof of that? Whereas for these alums, when they get together for their 50th, 50th anniversary, 50th, uh, you know, commencement uh, reunion, they say like, oh yeah, we were a war generation. Every one of us knitted, every one of us volunteered. And my thought is, that's a nice sentiment, but if you actually look at what is saved and what's recorded, this is not true. And it, it suggests that, you know, as we approach a time of crisis, maybe it helps to, you know, have each of us hold each other accountable, but also reach out and say, do you need help? Do you need assistance? So that if there is engagement, we facilitate it. But it also makes me wonder, you know, how many Americans are actually doing all these things that, you know, in 50 years time, they're going to say they did. 
Glenn, it looked like you also had another question. Yeah, Thank you. Um, you, you're, you're basically refuting some historians who argue about the, the prevalence of wartime public service towards yeah. suffrage, right, as a strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of evidence were they looking at that suggested that it, that it was prominent? I think what they're do they were looking toward uh, very much the luminaries, uh, driving forces, people like Jane Addams, uh, people like, uh, for example, Esther Pohl Lovejoy is one uh, figure from California and Oregon who gets involved to show that uh, women can in fact run their own hospital, not just as nurses, but as certified doctors, and therefore open up further uh, economic opportunities and career opportunities and social opportunities in the United States. And some of them do. Dr. Grace Jordan does uh, when she goes overseas. In fact, she works under Esther Paul Lovejoy at the medical, the American Women's Hospital in France. But others are just saying, well, you know, this seems like something I, I would like to do, but I can define when I no longer like to do it. And I think that's part of it, that it's not just, oh, you know, I feel a need to get involved. But they also say, all right, I think I've done my part. I can go now. And that very much runs against this patriotic narrative. This, by the way, is not just something that wealthy white uh, upper middle class women have. American Quakers do it as well when they're involved in work in France. Some of them just say, you know what? I agreed to do six months of work. It's the sixth month. I am going home. Yeah. Even, yeah. And it, it shows that, you know, this notion of patriotism, service to humanity, service to the world, it doesn't always match up with the record. I mean, it seems that even, even in cases where there was this sort of patriotic work being done, yeah. I don't necessarily see the link with suffrage. I mean, it may be there, but I don't, there's no, dis, there's no definite link there unless you can prove it. Yeah, no, it's, it's more the argument that, you know, these women were proving that they were complete citizens in service yeah. and therefore that they deserve complete citizenship at home. And you're, it's something that is more implicit on their end. Right. It's really Woodrow Wilson who makes it implicit when he calls on Congress to ratify the uh, suffrage amendment. Yeah, the lady no, point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And even then, like the, the response of these women is in their letters is that's great, that's not why we're over here. And a lot of them turn out to be very much critics of Wilson uh, in, a, sure. in, a shock, in a shock to many of you know, these campuses nowadays. Nowadays, <laughs> most of them were Republicans. Yeah. And I, I think that in itself is sort of telling that voluntary service in these humanitarian organizations did appear to skewer toward one political bent versus the other. Yeah. Good, good. Do you intend to continue research in this vein? Well, it's, it, it's part of the, the larger manuscript process. I didn't, uh, for the actual manuscript, looking at American people who get involved serving in France during the war and after it, Radcliffe's unit really doesn't work that way because it's only getting involved after the war. But I looked at what I had and I thought, I can do something with this, maybe as an independent article. And after 30 revisions and significant feedback, wanting like different things put in, different things taken out, you see the end result. And that's, some, that's one of the reasons I joke to students in my class, look, you guys think, oh, this is a great thing. You forget the years that go into it, you know, the feedback, some of it helpful, some of it, you know, extraneous and irrelevant. Yeah, but exactly. no, my, a little bit annoying. And yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But yeah, for me, like the question is, what is the legacy of goodwill? You know, if the the roughly five organizations I look at, the Smith, Wellesley, and Vassar units, the American Quakers, and the American Committee for Devastated France, run by Anne Morgan, they send about eleven hundred people to work in France. They spend roughly ten million dollars, not including you know free labor. They help over 100,000 people recover. They're celebrated. They're honored on both sides of the Atlantic. And yet their work doesn't actually affect the way that France develops as a country in some parts or that France and the United States relate to each other. So the bigger question I'm trying to answer is what is the lasting legacy of humanitarian activity, foreign relief? What does it mean, you know, two years down the road, five years down the road, 20 years down the road, or in this case, 100 years down the road, you know, what is the broader ram what are the broader ramifications of foreign relief on these countries foreign relations or on you know hygiene in these countries farming in these countries uh technological developments in these countries or even community centers in these different countries uh these american women and men introduced the idea of the community center the rec center in different parts of france 
free public lending libraries, traveling libraries, uh, you know, uh, medical dispensaries, snack time for schools, all these things that the French eventually make their own. And yet, you know, the French are never like, oh, this is an American idea. It's more presented to them as an effective way to restore their lives and make their lives better. And over time, the American seems French and the strange seems familiar. Any other questions for Michael before we wrap it up today? If not, I'd like to thank you again, Michael, for sharing thank you. a very no, interesting my pleasure. story with us. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank really you. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, uh, Vivian. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, all the rest of you out there.